in our housing. So a lot of great stuff coming up. Um, all right, so welcome everyone to the overview of uh, the 2020 Enterprise Green Communities Criteria Program. Um, this course is approved for one hour continuing education units, GBCI, BPI, and whole house AIBD, as well as uh, American Institute of Architects Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, today, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I'm here with the nonprofit Green Home Institute. And um, what we're going to be talking about today is basically the title of the session. Enterprise Green Communities 2020 is here. Uh, what makes it different? How is it uh, compared to the old 2015 version? That's really going to be the focus to get you all geared up um, for your submissions coming up here um, shortly. And before we get into it, I want to thank our top tier sponsor, um, Build Equinox with the Serve 2. Um, smart ventilation system unlike traditional ervs or hrvs it features many qualities of smart balanced ventilation with feedback and monitoring with a standard hrv or each of you get a constant low flow air rate with no relation to actual indoor air quality or occupancy so for example in here the first three days when the home is occupied the air quality is poor the erv just can't keep up when the occupants leave on vacation the erv keeps ventilating and wasting energy and making air quality good for nobody who's there since the serve actually monitors air quality, it ventilates only when it needs to. And compared to an ERV, the serve can also ventilate up to 300 CFM, quickly purging pollutants out of the home when you need to. Now, when no one is there and no ventilation is needed, the serve can recirculate and unify the home, providing some additional heating and cooling dehumidification in an energy efficient manner. The serve does this by monitoring both CO2, volatile organic compounds, VOC levels. Uh, to determine when ventilation is necessary. Many gases are undetectable to the human nose, yet can cause significant health issues, cognition, sleep quality, and now that we all work from home, work quality issues. And so even though you can't see them, the serve is constantly detecting these things, and you and your family and your clients can have the special set points they want for where they want their air quality to be to help uh, eliminate those pollutants as needed. And instead of ERV, the exchanger core, uh, for the serve uses a high efficiency heat pump system to exchange energy between incoming supply and outgoing exhaust air. That means conditioned, comfortable air, and they get up to MERV 13 now, which is uh, proven now to filter um, viruses and any other issues. The cool thing is, is this is manufactured right in Urbana, Illinois, in a, in a facility that's 100% powered by solar energy. It can also pair with some other great products like um, the Ream heat pump water heater, which can boost its capacity for radiant. It can pair with a Mitsubishi mini split to help distribute air around the house or multifamily unit, as we've seen in many projects. It can also pair with our friends at Water Furnace for the Geo Boost feature to improve comfort, health, and efficiency of geo, uh, uh, geothermal energy. So they also have a new UV uh, uh, filter, uh, item that can be added to the system to kill, certainly kill viruses. So check them out over at builtequinox.com today. Also, thanks to our second tier sponsors, Water Furnace. Water Furnace uses natural heating and cooling of the earth through ground, ground source heat pump technology, which currently creates the most energy efficient heating and cooling on the planet as well as, well as hot water. Forced air, radiant, combo, boiler replacement, dual fuel, and more. It can all work with these systems. All different types of setups, whether you're using horizontal, uh, vertical looping, uh, tight lots with trees, have an ocean nearby, different, or not an ocean, but a pond nearby, different strategies you can use for the drilling. You can go learn more about geothermal uh, and them over at geothermal for all. All right, well, I am very excited to welcome back Krista um, Egger, uh, who we've had here before. She is a vice president of national initiatives at the Enterprise Community Partners, uh, where she's able to blend her passion for social change and sustainability. With more than 15 years of experience leading energy efficiency and healthy housing initiatives with affordable housing stakeholders, Krista manages the Enterprise's national sustainability efforts. She leverages Enterprise Green Communities Platform, Climate Disaster Response uh, Work, Cultural Resilience Program to deploy equitable climate resilience programming um, as needed, 
And Krista has led technical development and public rollout of the 2015 and 2020 Enterprise Green Communities criteria, providing a strategic oversight for the Enterprise Green Communities certification program. Um, she's also helped with the Enterprise Health Action Plan Framework, which pairs public health professionals with affordable housing development teams. And I'm also excited to have an uh, Enterprise Green uh, Program Certification Manager here, Frederick Zindel. And I just want to publicly thank Frederick for all of his help with working with me and all of our projects over the last year. So he's been fantastic to work with, and it's great to see him virtually here in person and see all of you. So with that, I'm going to hand it to Krista now, and then we'll hear from Frederick later. Um, and so Krista, please do take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Brett. I'm really uh, excited to be here with your community and um, sharing the hour with, with Frederick, who does lead a lot of our day-to-day -day work with the certification program. He's the, he's the voice behind the certification mailbox, if you've ever reached out to that. He's leading our TA Providers Network and, and much more. So we'll be going back and forth over the next hour, sharing information out with you all about the the 2020 criteria. So as Brett mentioned, our objectives for today are to talk about the differences between our um, most current version of the criteria, 2015, and our newest version, the 2020. Uh, we'll talk about differences, similarities, and the timeline for transition between the two, along with other resources that you can access to, to help you along your journey there. I'm going to be sharing a little bit of context with you now about the Green Communities Program. And then Frederick and I will go back and forth on sharing information with you all about updates to each category in the program. And then Frederick will close this out with some information about certification. How do you actually apply this to your projects? And then we'll have time for questions at the end. So starting out at the highest level, just wanted to share that Green Communities is a program of Enterprise Community Partners. So Enterprise Community Partners is the organization that Frederick and I both work with. Um, we're a national nonprofit based in Columbia, Maryland that's pushing 40 years now. And Enterprise is in the affordable housing space. So we deploy capital, we advocate for policies, and we develop different programs to support quality affordable housing. About 15 years ago in 2004, Enterprise launched the Green Communities Program um, as initially a question to whether or not green building could be done in the affordable housing sphere. And, you know, I think collectively we've proven that definitively yes is the answer to that question. And we've been working ever since with all of you around the country on bigger and better ways to make green building standard in the affordable housing sector. So Enterprise Green Communities is the only national green building program geared exclusively towards affordable housing. And our goal is to help create housing that's not just affordable to purchase or to rent, but will, will be healthy and efficient and environmentally responsible. Um, and we have had tremendous impact over the years. We have active green community certification projects in 43 states. Um, and all of the dark blue states that you see on this map on your screen right here, either require or incentivize the use of green communities when they're making decisions in their state housing uh, finance agency about how to fund new affordable housing projects through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Project. So we've got a lot of activity um, and a lot of success stories around the country on applying the program. And you know, over the years, we've updated our criteria every four or five years. Um, we're continually pushing the bar um, with the criteria. And on your screen here, you see pictures of the covers of the last four versions. Um, and then while the covers have changed and while the explicit content inside the program has changed over the years, um, what everyone can rely on to be consistent across green communities are these principles that really guide our program, that it's achievable for all affordable housing development types, it's cost effective, it relies on proven strategies, it's designed to deliver significant benefits, it's technically sound and rigorous, 
and everything in the program is measurable and verifiable. So um, we spent about 18 months developing the 2020 criteria through this process map that you see on your screen here. We started off with editing the 2015 criteria with revisions and updates and responses to questions that we've received over all of the years of implementing that version of the criteria. Then we um, confirmed the themes on which we intended to focus our update. We conducted an industry scan for best practices in the market today. We convened working groups of um, green building subject matter experts, affordable housing developers, and others to generate content. We held a public comment review process last summer. Then we allocated points across everything, and then we went into design and then released the version in January. So it was truly co-developed with the affordable housing and green building sectors. Um, it's out on our website now. We'll be sharing more information uh, with you about it today. And after October 15th of this year, any project that's coming to certify with green communities for the first time will be required to use uh, this new version, but you have the choice um, between 2015 and 2020 in the meantime. So here's what the cover looks like for 2020. And here are the categories. Um, if you're familiar with our older version, you'll see that it has an eight category structure, which is very familiar to you. We've tweaked a few of these, um, and Frederick and I will be going into the details of these with you in just a moment. Um, but just to zoom out and think about big picture, the five uh, circles that you see on the top of your screen here are the five themes that we were really trying to lift up on top of our green communities framework through this 2020 update. So um, trying to prioritize um, the, the priorities of the impacted community for a project through integrative design. We developed strategies to drive down carbon emissions through a new path to zero. We're doubling down on practices to improve resident health and well-being outcomes. And we broaden our approach to water that Frederick will share later. And we strengthen strategies relating to property resilience. So take it as a whole, we really believe, as it says here on the bottom of the slide, that as a community of housing providers, we have an opportunity to make this vision a reality, um, addressing today's affordability challenges simultaneously with the impacts of our changing climate. So with that intro, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Frederick so he can walk us through um, the beginning of the criteria. Great, thank you, Krista. I'm just going to pull up my slides here. And, uh, and Great, um, thank you for that introduction, uh, both Brett and Krista, I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here with you all today as well. Um, so to kick off the criteria content of today's workshop, um, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes reviewing categories one through four and highlighting the major changes in each of the categories. So starting off in integrated design, um, when you think about resilience um, to water, health and performance, um, whatever your project is focused on, integrated design is going to be the backbone of the criteria. We know that implementing Implementing an integrative design process can determine the success of a project. And this is only more critical in 2020 as the affordable housing industry reaches for greater performance in their projects, um, along with greater health and wellness benefits for residents and communities, um, all while maintaining project budgets. So uh, to share a case example, um, one project team, after participating in an intensive integrated design charrette, which was part of Enterprises Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute in Boston. Um, Homeowners Rehab Inc. shared that the integrative charrette pushed the development team to view their project with a more holistic approach to reclaim their space and create a transformative impact on the community. And while initially struggling to meet the programmatic requirements um, and the community needs for the project, after engaging in the holistic design process, the developers shared that they were able to focus way more on who they serve, which are the residents, and how we can make it a better, um, and how they can make it a better life for them in the buildings they reside. 
So the concept and general objectives of an integrated process are the same in 2020 as previous iterations of the criteria, which is engaging in a holistic approach to pre-design by prioritizing information gathering um, and the residents around the community experience, setting goals for building performance and resident and health, uh, resident health and comfort, uh, encouraging buy-in and accountability from project team members. So we know that community outreach is a priority for many affordable housing developers and support teams in engaging in a meaningful integrative design approach. We are amplifying this process with a new, more comprehensive activity and tool as part of the 2020 criteria. Um, the project priority survey is the first requirement and a major change from previous iterations um, of the criteria. Uh, it should be completed prior to beginning your integrated design process. This tool is a measure to help provide teams with a holistic understanding of the context, place, and population you are serving. It'll help shape your priorities to drive project decisions and help garner project support and demonstrate need, while also serving as documentation for funding applications. Uh, to dive right in, um, 1.2, Charrettes and Coordination Meeting. Um, this is where you'll employ findings from conducting the project priority survey to execute effective meetings for a successful integrated design process by prioritizing appropriate um, collaborative meeting formats and activities. Under 2020, we're offering a little more guidance and asking for more accountability to encourage success um, by requiring that the new collaborative meetings template be completed and submitted for certification. Uh, as you'll see on your screen, Criterion 1.4 is about construction management. Um, this is really circled around the fact that it's always necessary to communicate and important to communicate project priorities and collaborate effectively with practitioners who are on site. Um, so now through this mandatory requirement, uh, 1.4, teams are now asked to be more intentional and develop an explicit education plan to ensure that those on site understand their role in achieving uh, the project objectives. Mm -hmm. um, so for certification, we'll look to see your project education plan. And our new, the one criterion I really wanna point out under this section is 1.7, our cultural resilience criterion. Um, this is optional right now, but it's our newest addition or one of our newest additions to this category, and to tie this whole, and it helps to really tie this whole category together. Um, and it, it's built and designed to enable developers to integrate community and resident participation in development processes so that the built environment honors cultural identities, resident voices, and community histories. Um, this helps build social cohesion, cohesion, health, and equity for the residents. Um, so, like I mentioned before, integrated design is really the backbone of the criteria. It helps teams understand the community context and environmental considerations when developing your project. And having this foundation of knowledge then can help you ensure compliance with our location and neighborhood fabric category. Um, and before I jump into the second category, I do want to let you all know that, um, as Brett mentioned earlier, we will be having a deeper dive into integrated design in two weeks um, with this platform. So I hope you all can join us then to um, uh, sorry, got distracted by question. Um, uh, help join us then to dive deeper into that into this category. So location and neighborhood fabric has been a really foundational category over the last few iterations of uh, Enterprise Green Community. And thinking about how we are living uh, through the in increasing impact of climate change, it's imperative to conserve our natural resources, protect ecosystems, and reduce flooding while developing affordable housing. In addition to natural resource conservation, this category has also provided strategies for teams to focus on 
providing access to amenities for residents. Uh, most of the criteria for this category received minor updates, so I'm going to focus on some of the larger updates. The first major update is to 2.1. Um, this now requires more specific or outlines more specific requirements for limiting development to curtail impact on sensitive lands. And to frame this work, we're now designating these sensitive lands as ecological resource protection zones, or ERPs, uh, as we like to call them for short. Uh, we're now asking teams to develop with a sharper focus on four ecological features, uh, one being the 100-year floodplain, limiting new development uh, within that, within the 100-year floodplain. The second one is conserving and protecting aquatic ecosystems, uh, which includes wetlands and not developing within 100 feet of those areas. The third is avoiding developing in areas that contain habitat for plant and animal species identified as threatened or endangered, and not building, not extending the building, built structures, roads, or parking areas into this area. And the fourth is agricultural soils. Um, so conserving agricultural soils by protecting prime farmland. And with these ERPs in mind, teams are required to document their site with an ERPs map. So on your screen, you'll see uh, an example of the ERPs map. Uh, this okay. one is specifically designed for the 100-year floodplain. Hey, Frederick. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. It's hard. Um, no we can't see the whole map on your screen right now. I wonder if there's a way yeah. that you could make us uh, be better able to see it. That's perfect. Thank you. Is that better? Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So this, like I was saying, this is the this is an example of the ERPs map, and this is specifically focused on the 100-year floodplain. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about why we are using this tool. Um, so this map will help teams and us understand the ecological features that are present on your site um, from the start of the development process, um, which will enable your team to uh, enable um, practice more sensitive development practices aimed at reducing harmful impacts to the environment. It also enables clear understanding and effective communication about the project site by specifically documenting boundaries of these areas. And it clearly illustrates if any herbs uh, fall inside the perimeter of the site to determine what, if any, features on site must be treated sensitively to ensure that there is no disturbance. And then more broadly, it just encourages awareness around the feature, um, the ecological resource protection zone features and familiarity with the practice of documenting these to foster sensitive development processes in the long term. And then I really want to call attention to the last two criteria of this category, which is access to broadband. These are brand new to 2020 and really branch out from the physical structures of connectivity um, to offering broadband services. And we included this really because we realized that there was a digital divide between rural and urban centers uh, throughout the country. And that access to broadband really opens up access to other services such as telemedicine and online job opportunity. 215A is required of all new construction and sub rehab projects in rural parts of the country and ensures that the property is being designed for broadband so when the service becomes available in a community, the property can easily be connected. Uh, 215B is our optional measure that requires that all units and common and amenity spaces have broadband internet access with at least a speed of 25 megabits per second for downloading and three megabits per second for uploading. This, was, this criterion was also one of our first agenda items in that rather uh, than this being optional for only rural com communities, uh, we now made it optional for both urban and rural areas of the country. So like I mentioned before, we originally learned that this, um, there was a huge divide between rural and urban centers uh, when it comes to digital services. 
Uh, but due to COVID, we realized how important access to broadband is for everyone and that it's a little more murky um, and really uh, the access really depends on low-income communities and the communities that we serve. Um, and it's so important now for schooling, telemedicine, remote work, um, and it's an issue that really faces both rural and urban areas, um, especially low income, lower income areas and communities of color. So now moving from understanding the community and their potential residents to providing access and understanding present envir environmental considerations on your site, uh, we now move to guidance to improving those conditions through our site improvement category. This category has remained um, fairly consistent between 2015 and 2020. However, there are a few notable updates. The first one is 3.2, minimization of disturbance during staging and construction. So compared hey, to 2015, yeah. Are you able to zoom out still a little bit more? It looks like it's still kind of getting cut off. Okay. Sorry about that. Let's see. No worries. Is there we go. Better? Let's, just, let's just go with that. I know we can see everything, but at least then we can see the text. So. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, glad everyone can see this now. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so 3.2, minimization of disturbance during staging and construction. Uh, compared to 2015, uh, we updated the title from erosion and sedimentation control to be more specific about the timeline it takes to build. Um, and we removed the exemption for the infill site and wanted to be more explanatory and expansive as to what we are including in the requirements. So 3.2 is focused on ensuring that topsoil isn't disturbed, which helps reduce stormwater runoff and sedimentation and pollution of local waterways um, that could uh, have the potential to be caused by construction debris. By protecting healthy soils and remediating Remediating compaction minimizes the adverse effects of construction activities. Compacted soils are less able to absorb water and resist plant root penetration and lack the porosity needed for adequate aeration. For this mandatory criterion, we require project teams working on sites larger than one acre to implement the EPA's National Pollutant Discharge um, Elimination System Stormwater Discharges from Construction Activities Guidance. Um, or local requirements, which is whichever is more stringent. We also have guidance for sites that are less than one acre now, as I mentioned, um, that range from stockpiling high quality topsoil uh, to protecting herbs, as I mentioned, under category two, um, to providing swales to divert surface stormwater from hillsides. The complete list is in our manual, and I encourage you all to check out the manual um, to see the more specific details about this one. And then there's surface stormwater management. Um, so this one was optional for 2015 and is now a requirement for new construction projects and rehab greater than or equal to 5,000 square feet. Uh, we updated the requirements to reflect um, using the percentiles as defined by the EPA. We feel that this aligns more uh, with other sustainability programs out there. And the, the second big change under this criterion is that, you know, this is now mandatory for new construction and rehab. And this really recognizes that all projects have some requirement for surface stormwater management. So these were the major updates to category three. We will now turn our attention to the first category that really focuses on the physical structure, um, which may not sound by, like it by its name, water. In the past, we have traditionally focused this category on water conservation. In 2020, we have updated this to also include water quality. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, water quality and conservation practices impact our health and well-being, um, our property operating expenses, and is a limited precious resource. Lead pipes were banned in new systems in 1986, and yet, according to a study by the American Water Works Association, nearly a third um, of the U.S. water system still contain lead service lines in 2016. 
So realizing that more water conserving fixtures doesn't necessarily equate to more water conservation. We have updated our water conservation criteria to be a little more flexible in achieving greater conservation through a calculator approach. Um, we updated the 2020 water calculator to take potential residents into consideration when developing your water conservation strategy. Now all projects will be required to reduce water consumption by at least 20% compared to baseline. However, we are still requiring all fixtures be water sense labeled where applicable. And as I mentioned, our newest addition to this category is water quality. Uh, there are three focus areas. One is replacing lead service lines, which is mandatory for sub rehab um, built before 1986. Um, developing a Legionella water management program, which will also be included in the operating manual under 8.1. Uh, this one is required for multifamily buildings with a cooling tower, a hot water system, or more than 10 stories in height. And our optional measure for all projects is testing water from dwelling unit faucets. So even though the quality of drinking water is tightly regulated in the United States, there are still vulnerable populations with frequent exposure to sources of lead. Adding this criteria, um, adding this criterion, um, further ensures that the people we serve have safe drinking water. And that concludes categories of one through four, and I'm gonna pass it over back over to Krista, but I wanted to see if there was any quick clarifying questions we could answer in like a minute or two before moving on. Uh, I think um, one of the questions on the 100-year um, floodplain was that, do you require no development in the 100-year, or is it just more of sort of that strategic development when there are 100-year floodplains? Um, we require no development within the 100-year floodplain. Sorry, Brett, can't hear you. Myself there. The other question was um, on broadband. You said you expanded it to urban areas, um, especially due to COVID-19, uh, and, and obviously clearly certain sections of the um, population still not getting access to the internet. We see that as a huge mm -hmm. concern. Is that expanded in the sense that it is required to review on projects or just an optional uh, extra credit now in the urban area? It's an optional extra credit. Um, so it hopefully will encourage more folks to uh, provide access to broadband in those areas. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Brett. Okay. Okay, we'll get back into the content then, starting off with um, category five, which is operating energy. So in the US, I'm sure many of you on the line are very familiar, um, Residential and commercial buildings account for about 40% of energy consumption. So this category is designed to um, limit that. So this category prioritizes the reduction of emissions through new strategies that we have in this section and a new level of certification that we're calling the plus level of green communities certification, which is brand new um, for our program. So. Um, in this category, we have, um, as you see here, about 10 different types of strategies here with A and B options for several of them. Um, the first chunk of these, so 51A through 55B, we are referring to this section as our path to zero, and I'll show you more about that in just a second. 
the other criterion in this category from sizing HVAC equipment to lighting and appliances to resilient energy systems are also available and are really valuable um, in terms of um, addressing your project. But I'm going to focus primarily on this path to zero. And what you can see on your screen here is a laid out version of these criteria that moves from the mandatory measures on the far left in orange. And then all of the others here are optional um, and provide increasing levels of stringency when you're reducing your emissions and or reducing your actual carbon footprint. So we can begin with criterion 5.1. So there's an A version for new construction, there's a B version for rehabs. This is mandatory for all projects. And the bottom line for new construction properties is that they will certify to Energy Star, any version really, um, the manufactured homes version, the certified homes version, or the multifamily new construction version. Um, and then rehabs of existing buildings will follow 5.1B. They'll, they'll meet a certain threshold of building performance shown through either an ASHRAE or an ERI model. And then they'll also report out on various commissioning requirements related to compartmentalization, insulation installation, and HVAC installation. And then all projects, whether new or rehabs, will also report out on their energy use intensity or EUI and their emissions. There are not thresholds of EUI or emissions which projects have to meet. It's just reporting out on that. And then after really taking care of that first criteria and the mandatory measures, projects can choose how far along they'd like to take the path to zero with the criterion that you see here. So they can do that by reducing energy usage with 5.2 A or B, installing renewables with 5.3 A or B, or going electric with 5.5 A or B. And if a project is designed to be near or net zero, those projects will achieve that highest level of certification, certification plus. Um, and we're really excited to share that Wisconsin State QAP is recognizing certification plus for their light tech project. So any of you all in that state might be especially interested in, in pursuing this version. So um, this is just a high level overview of this path to zero that we're trying to lay out to really make transparent the options that project teams have at their disposal. To, to manage their emissions profile. And you may be wondering about how to report out your project's EUI and emissions. Um, we worked hard to develop some templates for project teams use, some calculators in that regard. So you will not be having to do additional energy modeling. You'll simply be using those templates, which you can fill out with the inputs and outputs of the like normal energy model that you'd be doing for that property or some basic information about your project if you're choosing to follow a prescriptive pathway. So that's a, a sneak peek into category five, operating energy. I'm gonna move on to the next category, category six, which is about materials. So we know that thinking about health impacts and environmental impacts when purchasing, installing, disposing of building materials will improve those health and environmental conditions in the property. So that, that's what we are focused on here. So on this slide, you can see the list of different criterion that we have in this category. The first three are really new and they're, the first three are optional here also. Um, but this is really a new approach for us in terms of healthy, built, healthy building materials. We're looking at um, transparency and optimization criteria for avoiding chemicals of concern. Um, and we're standing upon the shoulders of many others in the industry who have done some fantastic work in this area. So we're really pleased about this new approach in our materials category. And then um, we move on to some of the more traditional um, criterion in regards to building materials, but we're really excited about a new approach to environmentally friendly building materials that shows up in 6.5. That includes considering embodied emissions and global warming potential of steel, concrete, and insulation in your project. So want to draw your attention to 6.5 if you're interested in, in doing that. And then I just want to highlight criterion 6.4, which is healthier material selection. If you go to our website and look at this criterion, you'll see a full chart. You only see a portion of it here, but this lays out um, different 
mandatory and optional measures and recommendations for several different product categories that you have in your buildings. Um, and I'll just call your attention to the first one that you see here about interior paints, coatings, primers, and wallpaper. Um, it's similar to 2015 in that it has a VOC content thresholds according to the South Coast Air Quality Management District standards. One thing that's new here for 2020 is that we're adding for wall finish paints a requirement to make sure that VOC emissions are verified um, through the CDPH standard method. So just wanted to call that to your attention and you know recommend that you take a close look at this criterion in particular after we get off the line. So with that, I'll move to category seven, which is healthy living environment. This has traditionally been one of our largest uh, categories in the program, and it addresses design, construction, and operation strategies that contribute to a healthier environment by reducing exposure to toxins, by managing the indoor environment, and by promoting health through design. In the development of the 2020 criteria, one of our goals was to try to help you all be able to navigate this category a little bit more easily. So we did split this category up into these three sections about hazards and toxins, about managing the indoor environment, and then about health through design, as you can see here. The first section of measures here are really tried and true strategies that many of you all will be familiar with from radon mitigation um, to integrated pest management. I would like to call your attention to Criterion 7.6, smoke-free policy. Um, it's having and implementing a smoke-free building policy is now required, not optional, for all building common spaces in your properties. It's not required for all um, the living spaces in your property, but it is required for all common areas. And you can get additional points if you apply to the full property. So wanted to draw your attention to that. And then within the second section here, many of these um, are, are new, but we start off with ventilation, which has been a component of green communities from the very beginning, and it relies on ASHRAE ventilation standards. Uh, then we have a new criterion on dehumidification, which I'll uh, draw your attention to more in just a moment, and the new criterion about construction pollution management, noise reduction, both of which are optional if you'd like to pursue those. And then our third and final section here, I'll share more about in a moment. But let me, I just wanted to call your attention to a few more details about this new criterion about dehumidification. So there are two options that you can use to comply with this if you'd like. Um, on the one hand, you can install supplemental dehumidification equipment to keep relative humidity below 60%. Or if you don't want to do that, in a sense, you can be dehumidification ready, <laughs> whereby you um, include dedicated space, drain electrical hookups for permanent supplemental dehumidification systems um, if you would like to install them in the future. and now you install RH monitoring equipment with alerts and the ability to log readings over time. So this is an optional criterion that you can choose. Um, however, it is mandatory if you're in climate zones 1A, 2A, 3A, or 4A, and you're following one of our more advanced energy efficiency criterion that shows up in category five. So we're trying to pull together the connection between increased energy performance requires increased um, moisture um, control in your project as well. So I wanted to call your attention to this. And then the last thing I'll show you in this category is just highlighting the new criterion 711, 712, and 713 that make up this promoting health through design section of the program. These um, touch active design, universal design, and healing centered design. And we have a um, great criterion written. I encourage you to read the full rationale and requirements for these on the web, um, that all projects will be required to choose one of these to implement in their project and welcome to, to implement more, you know, two or three if they would like. But all projects will be selecting the one in this, of this uh, triad um, that will provide the most benefit um, to their property. Then finally, I'll go on to the last category, category eight, which is operations, maintenance, and resident engagement. So this category is relatively similar 
to what you saw in this final category in the 2015 criteria. No measures here were removed or added in whole, but we did revise each of the criterion that shows up in this category. Um, most significantly, we revised the last criterion here, which is about utility collection, monitoring, and, and benchmarking. So this new approach to benchmarking in our program just tries to clearly lay out four different methods that a team can use to report out um, and view in real time their building's utility expenditures. And the methods that you see here, A, B, C, and D, you can pick whichever one you want. And uh, we don't have a preference for which one you, you choose. We're just trying to lay out the different options that really align with the different ways that utility service providers in the country allow property owners to access data when they don't um, pay for all of the bills in the property. So the first three methods here, A, B, and C, are about reporting out all data, and then the last one is about sampling. So that'll wrap it up for our deep dive into the criteria that's all encapsulated into the 2020 um, program. And then I'd just also like to share that an added feature of 2020 is that there's automatic co-certification with WELL for all pro properties that certify for 2020. So WELL is a program of the International Well Building Institute. It's a leading tool for advancing health and well-being in buildings. Um, and no additional action is needed for properties to achieve, achieve this with 2020. Um, the certification confers upon completion through a partnership that we've established um, with WELL and their involvement in our criteria development process. So I'll turn it back to Frederick um, with how to apply this to your projects through some key tips and tools related to to our certification process. Frederick, the screen looks great, but I think you're muted. <laughs> I must have double clicked it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yes, thank you, Krista, for that. And I'm just going to take some time now to just walk through our certification process um, and call out some of the things that remain the same and some of the things that um, highlight some new tools and resources that we have uh, in light of 2020. So. Um, I was originally going to illustrate this process with a video that we have. It's three minutes long, but I did share that link. Uh, it was not working during our tech rehearsal. I did share that link with Brett, who will share it with you all. Um, it's a great, quick little video just to give you a high-level overview of how the process works for green communities, um, and I encourage you all to watch it. Um, so while the criteria has been updated, the steps for certification are pretty much largely the same. Uh, Pre-build applications are going to be due 30 days prior to construction, which has always been true of the program. And post-build applications are due within 60 days of construction completion. And with these phases, we'll still work together in the same manner that we have before. So your reviews and re-reviews uh, will be uh, conducted within 30 days of submission. We'll pro provide comprehensive feedback if we need informa more information for approval. Our waiver process is the same as before as well. You'll apply for a waiver via the portal um, for any mandatory criterion when, extenu uh, when extenuating circumstances preclude compliance. We'll look out for your request in the portal and work together to chart the best course forward um, like we always have. And then just throughout your entire construction process, uh, we'll be here to provide you technical assistance where we can. Um, we're here to support this transition, uh, so don't hesitate to lean on us. Um, like Krista mentioned, I am the voice behind the cert box, so if you ever email in there, you'll probably 98% of the time get a response from me. So um, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here. We're here to support you all with everything we can. So while the process largely remains the same, we do have some new tools to support you in 2020. 
I'm just going to quickly change my screen. Um, does everyone see this okay? I just want to make sure that my yeah, sharing is paused. It's good? Okay. So this is the 2020 Criteria website. We have designed the site to be interactive for you all. It's a one-stop shop to access all the information you need. Our agenda will be here and updated automatically. Our frequently asked questions will be here and updated automatically. Um, for instance, if you see 2.15b, you'll see at the top, all right, the addendum um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, if you scroll down a little more, you can get a PDF of our 2020 criteria. Um, you guys aren't in New York City, so you don't need to worry about that. And here is the link to our templates for certification. This area houses all the template documents uh, that you'll need for 2020 certification. Uh, you're able to format the original page. So I'm just going to go back again. So you can click new construction and rural, and it'll bring up all the criteria and filter out um, that you need to comply with, plus the optional measures that are specific to this project type and location. Um, and you're also able to uh, export and download checklists, which um, I am blanking on how to do at this moment, but it is a possibility. <laughs> uh, but these are all the tools that are available to you. Um, like I said, all the FAQs and agenda will be, uh, you'll have access to in real time and all templates and documentation are here. So in order to certify, you'll still go to the portal as you normally would have. You can get it through this 2020 site by clicking certification portal um, and logging in as you normally would. Um, and I just want to note that after October 15th, all new pre-built submissions must use the 2020 criteria. Uh, all new projects certifying to 2020 will incur a fee um, that will be collected in the portal. It, 1250 at the time of pre-build and 300 at the time of post-build. Um, you have until, like I said, you have until October 15th to get any 2015 pre-build projects in. We will not accept any shell applications. They need to be fully filled out and ready to be fully reviewed um, by October 15th. And then finally, we did reorganize the typical Enterprise Green Communities website um, to make it a little easier to uh, access news and other resources of the Green Communities program. So I um, that is an overview of the certification process, the tools that you have available to you. And I'm going to hand it back over to Krista to close us out and some Q&A going. Thanks, Frederick. Um, so just to, just to recap, the 2020 criteria um, is presented in much of the same format as previously with 2015, but we're really diving into integrative design, healthy housing, path to zero, water, conservation and quality, and resilience in, in more ways than ever before. Um, if you want to learn more about the program, generally, you can go to the link that you see here, or if you want to go to the criteria site, which Frederick just previewed, you can go to greencommunitiesonline.org, and any questions at any time, we'd really welcome at certification at enterprisecommunity.org, um, and we really look forward on working with you throughout your next project. So thanks so much, and we can turn it back to Brett. Can you hear me, everyone? Great. Uh, yes, we do have uh, a lot of questions coming in. We've got some time for some questions here. If you all can stick around with us for a little bit. Um, 
And before we get to those questions, I just wanted to remind everybody um, watching this live right now, uh, check your inbox for the certificate um, here in about 10 minutes. And then uh, there'll be a survey there. Please take it, even if you don't need CEUs, we love your feedback. And um, if you miss it, it'll be sent to you an hour later. For those of you watching this in the future on demand, there is a quiz you need to take with an 80% passing rate uh, to get that. And in order to take that quiz on our website, um, head over to the YouTube logo link, and then underneath it, click show more. And then on the right side, you'll see something that's referencing need your Con Ed or CEUs. Click that link, follow the instructions for the quiz, and complete the quiz to get your CEUs. And again, uh, before we get to all those questions coming in, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi Electric to hit net zero, zero carbon, all electric in new homes, single family, multifamily, new and existing, uh, Ream, uh, heat pump, water heaters, most efficient out there, and build Equinox for smart ventilation systems to keep us healthy. Thanks to them and everyone who allows us to do what we do. Um, so, Frederick, I heard you say at the end, and I and I and I think it was pretty quick, and I was a little bit focused on getting this last part up. I want to have you repeat it again about fees and costs. You can help me out, and I want to understand what I heard. Were you referencing uh, 2015 submissions that came in late? There would be a fee. Is that what I heard, or can you tell me a little bit more about what you said there? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry for the lack of clarity there. So, 2020. Projects will now incur a fee. At pre-build, it's twelve fifty, and at post-build, it's three hundred. Uh, so, so the the pre-submission is is uh, one hundred and what what was the number? How much again? Twelve hundred and fifty. Twelve hundred and fifty. Yeah. For any type of size project, or yeah. Okay. Um. And and the the final certification is three hundred. Correct. Okay. And that submission fee is incurred right when you so you can set up your portal still, no cost to get in or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's just when you go to submit, um, there's a one thousand two hundred and fifty dollar fee. Uh, now does that Correct. get you a certain amount of reviews? Is that just one review? It's just one flat rate. Okay. So. It's unlimited reviews, Brett, okay. Um, okay. regardless of whether you pass with flying colors the first time or you need six <laughs> re-reviews, um, you won't incur another fee. It's just the one time each with pre-build and then with post-build, and it's collected just right in the portal. Okay. Um, and is this, so, um, so there's a question that came in, and it wasn't regarding fees, but I think it might be relevant to this conversation. And that is, um, you know, projects that uh, weren't aware of 2020. And I mean, I, I think the question was more on the technical side, but let's lump this question in here now too, who weren't aware of the costs and already put their budgets together. Um, you know, what, uh, I mean, are there any kind of waivers or exemptions on either, you know, if they're not gonna be submitting by October 15th, um, and again, they weren't aware of some of these technical changes or quite frankly, honestly, <laughs> this is the first time I heard about the cost. Uh, they weren't aware of that and it wasn't in the budget. Um, are there any kind of waivers? Can we reach out to you all? Can anyone reach out to you all? Especially in light of the fact that, um, you know, suddenly now we have this this pandemic we have to deal with. Um, yeah. So, I, you yeah, know, you, I, so I, yeah, that's, I guess my question that I'm asking on behalf of myself and uh, a lot of other people here who are, Kind of chiming in about some of these costs <laughs> yeah absolutely um reach out to us through that certification email box and um we are certainly planning on evaluating you know hardship requests for that fee we try to um keep it uh at a small uh but but modest level to help cover some of our costs with operating the, the program that doesn't apply to 2015, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so let's see, the other questions we have, we've got a lot of other questions coming in here. I just wanted to make sure that we got to that one. Um, so let's talk real quick, Energy Star certification. 
Um, so just confirming that that is a requirement on new builds and not um, renovations, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's some concern here about certifying each unit under the HOMES program, but you mm -hmm. had mentioned that um, you can also do the new multifamily, uh, new construction of the high-rise one, correct, which I believe is whole building. Um, so the Energy Star Multifamily New Construction Program, which is for the bigger buildings, is for the big building, they, right. for the entire like building. They do have specific um, checks for all of the units and in the property, though. But but yes, right. if you're a new construction property, we are requiring the Energy Star certification. Um, we we do allow and and often see projects that are using sampling like through ResNet's policies to achieve that so you're not actually testing or modeling every single unit and we're um, planning to proceed with that as we have with with past with our 2015 criteria too okay um keeping on that energy topic um so is it true that renovations no longer need to hit a certain um, ASHRAE 90.1 or HERS rating target, or at least not using those specific tools? Um, or is it that it's, is it, I understand that it's just simply mandatory to use your sort of EUI tool that you've created. And then if you want the extra credits, you can go after the HERS ERI or ASHRAE 90.1 renovation goal. It's a good question. The info that I shared a little bit ago was just a real, skim over the requirements. So um, for rehabs, it is required for all projects to meet a certain threshold of energy efficiency that you demonstrate either through an ERI slash HERS model or an ASHRAE model. Um, and then you would also share out your EUI info. Your EUI and emissions info, we don't care. I mean, we care, but we're not going to be holding your feet to the fire on what what EUI amount you have. Um, we're just looking at that for reporting purposes so that we can um, start to learn more about the performance uh, levels throughout properties that come through our program. You are required though to make sure that your property is not using more energy than the HERS target and the ASHRAE target that we have in the program. So if you go to this criteria site that Right, you just lift it up here on the screen, and if you click through to 51B, you'll be able to see that information. And um, just a note for those of y'all who are just using our criteria site for the first time, just wanted to um, emphasize what Frederick shared when he was looking through the site, that depending on the filters that you choose on the side of your screen, whether it's new construction or rehab, the different criteria will show up. So if you've clicked new construction, you won't see that rehab standard. So just make sure you've clicked substantial or moderate rehab so you can see that. Great, thank you so much. Um, so this question is about uh, on-site inspection and testing, especially you know in, in regards to third party. You know, typically the HERS rater, the energy rater, is doing that from an energy efficiency standpoint. Um, but what other kind of, you know, inspection, testing, documentation requirements are there uh, that need to be done on the site? And do they have to be third party? Or I guess I know, I know that's a pretty in-depth in question, probably it'd be its own webinar on its own, documentation process of EGC, like maybe we should do that. But I guess just on the overall, um, can you comment on that question? Sure, yeah, so the first rater, or if you're not going the first pathway, you're using the ASHRAE pathway, you know, your energy professional um, is your primary third party um, who's working with your team to verify different levels of performance with your, with your homes. Um, there are other on-site performance tests that, um, don't explicitly necessarily fall within that energy star or energy efficiency verification area. For instance, um, if you've chosen to pursue some of the new water quality measures, there's actual like test results of your water quality that you would need to share to justify or to verify that you've 
met those thresholds. Um, to do those tests, anyone on site can take a sample of water, send it to an EPA approved lab, get a result back and then share that with us. Um, and then there are some on-site verification requirements that we've added in the ventilation section, but those could easily be done by your rater or the person who's helping you with the energy efficiency as, as that's a standard um, practice there. The other measures um, in, your, in your project are more often going to be verified visually um, or with submission of like different spec information or, or planning information for your property. Okay. Um, yeah, and you had mentioned uh, ventilation. Are there any um, ventilation requirements on moderate rehabs at all? Or can projects like that basically are not required to do anything with ventilation, especially in light of COVID-19 where we're starting to learn that improper ventilation and filtration you know, may be causing you know, significant problems, I especially would imagine in, you know, tighter existing multifamily properties? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we had a lot of discussion about that in the criteria development process. Where we ended up is that it's our ventilation standards, which require like mechanical ventilation for ASHRAE 6222, 6221, are required for new construction and substantial they're not required for mod rehabs. You can get points as a mod rehab project if you follow those standards, but we didn't require it. Um, I completely agree though that the COVID pandemic has really validated in some ways the importance of ventilation um, in all of our homes. I think there's the reason that we did not require mechanical ventilation for mod rehabs is because of the cost constraints of installing a system mm -hmm. in a property that has a limited budget for a rehab because it's a mod rehab and and it's a new system, you know, adding ducts and chases and you know new penetrations through the sidewalls where you might not have had that before. It could go on and on. So that's that's why we didn't require it. You know, we were making that decision pre-pandemic certainly and. I'm I'm glad to hear now that more project owners who are doing rehabs are interested in figuring out how they can actually do this given their like structural and cost constraints. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to, you know, we'd love to work with you all as you try to do that or connect you with other technical um, experts in the field as you try to go through that. I'd really encourage it. But um it's it's not required in 2020 sure. mod we have good thank you um can you uh so you you mentioned the the sort of dual certification with well um yeah. two quick questions uh well i believe is a sort of just like lead a good better best approach so you can get higher levels of well is my is my understanding yeah. of it or maybe i'm wrong but um um so i guess the first you know first question is it, it sounds like you get the lowest level of well, but can you, through your program, uh, achieve higher standards through the well certification, the higher levels? Um, uh, if you submit to them, would there be an extra cost for that, or would that be a side deal that you have to make with well? Uh, and then also, I know well doesn't touch single family, but you all do, so do you still get the well certification on single family projects, if you've heard of that? Yeah. Those are great questions. So yes, you would get it on the single families. And you know, if you lay the 2020 criteria and Wells program side by side, um, you'll see some similarities. You won't see exact matches across all of the criteria. And we spent a lot of time with well staff and um, experts on taking um, their core concepts that were most critical to their team and well, and in a sense, um, really identifying what the most critical elements of those were that apply to multi-family um, residential construction in the United States. You know, they have some measures that are more designed for their global audience and aren't as relevant here in the States because of other uh, policies and codes that, that we have in this country, and then they have a number of standards which are more geared towards commercial buildings. Um, and so it took a lot of massaging, you know, to, to get to the place that we are, but um, there's no additional fee or, or testing that needs to be done um, above and beyond the 2020 process to get that certification. The hmm. question about could I achieve the highest level of well 
with 2020 is a great question. And I, um, if you could email us, uh, or Brett, if you could share that person's contact info with us, we'd be happy to talk through that. And I think we could collectively with Well um, try to chart out a path for how that could happen so you don't have to go on that journey on your own. Great. Um, so getting back to the um, registration timeline, uh, just to make sure we have it correct here, what is the 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 deadline for 1015 is a, is a pre-submittal, correct? Like like on 1015 at midnight, you can do your last 2015 pre-submittal, or what? Uh, what are we talking exactly? Yeah, pressing the submit button for your pre-build um, application for a project up until October 15th, you can use either 2015 or 2020. After that date is when um, 2015 won't be an option for you. Is that 11:59 Eastern Standard? I know some people just go to the very end, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll accept it all the way through a Pacific Pacific time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Probably a lot of people maybe just get yeah. out. And <laughs> and if you currently have a project like in progress in our portal that you haven't submitted for pre-build. Yeah. If you haven't already, you're going to start getting monthly email reminders from us saying finish right. it and submit it before October 15th or start creating a new one with 2020. Right. Um, so you uh, have a, um, uh, a, a program or a listing, I guess we'll call it, um, Enterprise Green Communities Technical Assistance Providers or Partners. Um, so can you speak to that in lieu of this question that came in specifically was, you know, are there requirements for credentials? Mm -hmm. And they use an example such as the Lead for Home Green Raider that are also required for enterprise. And so I thought, you know, this would give you an opportunity to talk about that technical assistance providership. Piece. You want to take that one, Frederick? Sure. I was going to ask the same thing. Um, yeah. So. We do not require any type of accreditation like a CBC with LEAD, um, GA or Green Raider or anything like that. Uh, we do have a technical assistance provider database. Um, we basically source this list of, um, of organizations throughout the country that uh, come to us and apply under specific categories such as integrated design, resilience, health, um, Etc., and we'll evaluate them on a quarterly basis and apply, um, approve them based on what they provide to us with information um, on how in these specific categories that they apply to. Um, not all groups receive all categories that they apply to, um, but this is a really great list and resource for those of you who might need some help in integrated design um, and contacting organizations that are in your area or work nationally, um, or if you need someone a little more technical working on resilience um, information and want to comply with our standards, uh, these folks should really be familiar with our program, affordable housing industry, and, uh, and their specific technical expertise that they offer. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Going back to the beginning, the, the new contractor uh, education plan, um, are you all going to be providing any kind of examples or details on, you know, how that can be done, whether it has to be in person, can be online, how long? So, for example, you know, and I and I use, and we work a lot with leads, so I, I kind of look to their trades training program where it's very specific. It's it's eight hours long, you know, at the at the very most with, you know, these certain set of contractors who have to be involved, um, you know, uh, non-consecutively across that and learn about these items, you know, before the project starts, but on the project, very specific. So what, um, you know, what other kind of guidelines or help can you give folks who are trying to figure out these contractor education plans? Are you going to be releasing anything? Um, yeah, can you can you help us out there? Yeah, definitely. So that's um, in Criterion 1-4, mm -hmm. and the requirements of that category are a little more lengthy than some of the other criterion. Um, it does call out the specific information that must be included 
mm -hmm. um, where that needs to be documented, who should be involved. Um, and then in the recommendations section for that criterion, there, there are recommendations you know, about how to put that together in, in different ways. And then some resources at the end with um, some ways to, to go about finding help for that. But this is um, a criterion which we anticipate um, other more resources for over the coming year. And um, we'll be lifting up the best examples that we see through the certification pipeline to share out with others too. Great. Um, well, I uh, I think we got through quite a bit here. I know we're going to have you back in two weeks because it actually take a deep dive into yeah. that section anyway, I think, and cover yeah. some of those pre-design conversations. So I suppose that's another answer to that question too, uh, the, yeah. the integrative design <laughs> process. Um, so uh, just real quick before we wrap up, uh, where can people go to uh, find out more information, learn more, contact someone if they have any specific questions? Yeah, you've got you've got the right slide up here. So enterprisecommunity.org slash green will get you information about our program, including the past version 2015, as well as the current version 2020. And there's you can directly watch that video that Frederick mentioned earlier if you go to that site too. Um, or if you want to go straight to the technical content on 2020, you can go right to greencommunitiesonline.org to find out more um, content about the criteria as well as templates to use for certification and a link to the certification portal. Um, and feel free to reach out to us anytime at certification at enterprisecommunity.org. Great. Well, Krista Egger, uh, Frederick Zendel, a uh, huge thanks to you all. Thanks to the enterprise community partners for allowing you to come and um, uh, share with us today. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And again, before we close out a public service announcement, we want to see you all in person someday. We love doing webinars, but we want to see some folks in person. Hopefully sooner than later, we got a long way to go. So please, you know, wear your mask, stay away when you can. And building science, we need to improve all of our buildings. We need to get out there and make these changes. So get involved, advocate, uh, increase ventilation, filtration. I think it's gonna help us a lot in many ways beyond just COVID. So wanna see you all someday. Take care out there, stay safe, be well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone.